Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Grace and I will be your host tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful time. So this event is brought to you by Decode as part of our speaker series. As a bit of a background for those of you who aren't familiar with us yet, Decode is a global community of ambitious creators and passionate builders. We are a nonprofit with roots in the tech and entrepreneurship community in Silicon Valley, and we teach entrepreneurship classes at Berkeley every semester. We hope to give students, entrepreneurs, founders, and investors a platform to share, connect, and be inspired. Over the past five years, our annual Decode Innovation Conference has been the largest tech and innovation conference co-hosted by Berkeley and Stanford students and alum and entrepreneurship centers. We have had over 10,000 audiences every year from all around the world. Some of our notable speakers include founder and CEO of Zoom, board member of Tesla and SpaceX, CEO of Y Combinator and CEO of Google X, among many others. Our 2020 conference back in October garnered 1.3 million views across 44 countries and had thus prompted us to kick off the speaker series in January, continuing to today. So our next speaker session will be on June 23rd, so next Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m., and we would love to see you all there. You can check out our social media channels for more information. If you would like to volunteer with Decode on future events, or if you'd like to discuss any potential partnerships with Decode, please do email us at careers at decode.build. And I repeat, careers at decode.build. We will also be kicking off our part-time Decode Venture Capital Fellowship, which will run from mid-September 2021 to the end of May 2022. So our network of volunteers and alum had gone on to renowned companies, including A16Z, Axile, GGV, Sequoia, Y Combinator, um, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Airbnb, Amazon, App, Apple, Facebook, Google, and NASA, among many others. So for more information, you can subscribe to your emails or contact join at decode.build. So early decision applications are due on June 30th, which is approaching very soon, and regular applications are due on August 31st. So now for today, if you have any questions for our speaker, you can send them in via Zoom chat. So we will try to go through as many questions as possible, but due to time constraint, we might not be able to cover all of them. So for those of you who are selected to join the round table, it will be right after the Q&A session, so please stay and be waited to invite to the breakout room. Just a few about our future event. Uh, so next week on June 23rd, we have with Forrest Norod, who is the SVP and GM at AMD. And on July 8th, which is, um, we have Thomas Eisen, who is the professor at Harvard Business School at, at, and ex-principal at McKinsey. And Ongoing on, we have Jason Conyard, who's coming on July 15, who is the CIO at VMware. So I will put the event link, uh, Eventbrite link in the chat. So you saw um, this link include the future event. So please do check out, or you can just search uh, decode on Eventbrite for future event. All right, Shua and Adam are here. So I guess we can start now. Uh, so for today's session, we are excited to welcome Adam Chire, who is the co-founder at Siri and Weave Labs. So Adam helped start four successful businesses, Siri, which is sold to Apple to build a Siri assistant, Weave Lab, which is sold to Samsung to build Bixby, uh, Sentien, which is a machine, machine learning company, and change.org, as we all know the world's largest petition platform. So Adam has offered more than 60 publications and 37 patents. At SRI International, he was chief architect of Kalo, the largest AI project in the US history. Adam graduated with the highest honor from Brandeis University and received the outstanding master's student award from the UCLA School of Engineering. So this session will be moderated by Shuo Chen, who is the general partner at IOVC and CEO of Shinec, 
a Silicon Valley-based nonprofit community of 5,000 plus engineers passionate about entrepreneurship. She is also a lecturer at UC Berkeley and faculty member at Singularity University. So now let's welcome Shaw and Adam. Thank you very much, Grace. Adam, uh, thank you so much for making time to be here. It is such a pleasure. Uh, as we were saying in the pre-stage interview, this quote came to mind in our conversation where uh, sci-fi author Arthur C. Clarke is famous for the quote saying, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what is really cool is that you've done both Quite literally, you've built advanced technology companies with highly successful exits, and you're a magician. So welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, I think the audience is super excited to hear from you. I know a number of them have applied and are excited to talk to you um, in the post-event roundtable session as well. Um, if anyone has any questions in the meantime, though, please do feel, uh, feel free to send it in chat, and I'll try my best to kind of slot it in. But maybe, Adam, to start, if you could take us all the way back to your childhood um, and talk a little bit about your experience growing up and how that became a critical part of why you became such an innovative, creative person that you are today. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think I had a pretty normal childhood, so I can't, you know, directly say that was the moment. But if I were to pick one thing that I don't see as much in children today, or at least in my, my child, um, is at that time, I was bored a lot. And I, my mom was relatively strict. I was allowed one hour of television or screen time a week. And other than that, you know, I was living in a small town with lots of woods and forests around and not that much else. And so um, I would have to create and dream and build and fill the void um, that was, you know, boredom in a sense. I would have to, you know, create my way out of boredom. And today, many of the, the children I see growing up, growing up have so much coming at them. And I talk about passive uh, time and active um, time. So passive or consumptive is like you're watching uh, a TV show, you're playing a video game. Active or creative is you're creating a video game or you're you're you know creating a TV show or a script or a toy or what have you. And for me, um, I would say what what led, you know, if I were to pick one thing that led to some of my future success, um, it was that I spent time as a child because I was bored, having to actively create things that would at least just interest me. And in many ways in my career, all the way through, I still do what I did then. Then I would, you know, my mother would give me a stack of cardboard from the cleaners. They would piece one piece of cardboard in a shirt and she would save them. And that paper cardboard material was my, my tool of choice because with pens and paper and staplers and tape, I could create anything. Today it's software. I can I can really build anything I can dream of, but but that same pattern exists. I really appreciate you framing uh, your childhood that way because uh, a lot of my students at Berkeley will know in class I'm always talking about balancing between consumptive and creative habits. So <laughs> since childhood, it sounds like you were already doing a lot of things that were very creative in nature. And fast forward onto your more formative years because we have a lot of students and younger alumni in the audience. Um, for their reference, could you talk a little bit about how you became interested in the world of software and programming throughout your high school and college years and how you decided to study what you did? So I was really lucky. I, I almost felt like computers were invented just for me. Um, I know it's a very selfish view, but uh, I was in high school when computers, they were TRS-80, you know, personal computers arrived at the school for the very first time. I remember seeing them show up and walking over to one and like trying to figure out what this thing was. And there was an on switch and I hit the on switch and then nothing happened. I didn't know you needed a floppy disk to, you know, bootable floppy disk for, for it to be able to come up and do something. It's like, oh, these are complicated. This is hard. Um, 
so in the beginning, I was interested, but had no understanding of it. Um, but what, what really changed for me was there was an announcement after school, one of those after school announcements, we'll be having a group today meeting uh, to do the computer club. I'm like, oh, computer club, you know, that sounds interesting. I think I'll go. And when I got there, they said, oh, no, this is not a computer club. This is a computer team. We compete. The Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, gives out to all schools in the country uh, challenge tests. And every week, you have 30 minutes to write a program that can answer five computational questions. So you write a program, they put in an input, you do, the program will do some calculations, spit out an output, and if, you get, if the program gets the right answer, you get a point. So your top score will be six points. And, and the top students all submit their scores and they compete against other schools around the country. And you don't know software, you don't know computing, so you can't join. And that really got me, got me going. Telling me I can't do something is probably the best way to engage me to do something. So I started stealing the questions, which were crumpled up in the waste paper baskets and thrown away printouts of people trying to, they'd written a program, didn't work, they threw it away. I would take those and from that, the questions and the software program, I tried to figure out what was going on. Um, and about three weeks later, I came back and said, all right, I wanna take your silly programming test. And by the end of that year, before I had taken my first ever class in computers, I was the fourth best in the school and we won the state championships and competed in the national championships. So I got in sort of independently by, you know, initially just trying to figure things out on my own. But then there were these three seniors who were so smart. I was trying to keep up with them and learn from them and outdo them. And, and that, that, that competition and that, that camaraderie uh, from the older kids um, really, really you know, got me into it. And once I started to learn to program, um, it was the only thing I ever wanted to do from that point on, the only thing I was really good at. And the last point when I say computers were, felt like they were invented just for me, I took the first ever AP computer science exam. There was no previous exams to, to study from. It was, here's a test and you didn't know what was going to be on it. And I, I literally figured out half the test from the multiple choice. I'm like, oh, that's what data structures are. And then I could use it on the essay programming parts. But um, yeah, so early times, um, but once I found it, I just loved it. Because like cardboard, you can you can do anything with software. What an amazing story! Uh, I think, especially for a lot of the students in the audience today, a lot of them went through a similar discovery process, although probably with slightly different technologies. Since I think a lot of them grew up with cell phones, very different than even when I was growing up. Um, and growing up in the world of internet, as obviously you're looking at the whole slew of different technologies, even uh, obviously for you back then, how did you sort through where your most exciting opportunities are? We were talking a little bit through your vision of the world, and it sounds like that was developed throughout your career. So if you could walk us a little bit through from early into your career, how you eventually developed the long-term vision that you really wanted to pursue for the rest of your career. Yeah, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so I got into computers, as I said, like a sophomore or so in high school. You know, I, I learned the basic programming language and then Pascal and C and all of these procedural languages. And by the time I got to college, I sort of plateaued. I felt, you know, I was like, I was young and foolish and I, I, I know programming. I'm not learning anything more. I've learned different languages, but that's just syntax. Is that all there is to computing? And even when I looked at some of the like artificial intelligence or once you open it up and, and you saw what was inside at the time, it was disappointing to me. It, it was just more of the same procedural. And then I came across a class. Uh, it was led by a professor, uh, Tim Hickey, who still, still works uh, at Brandeis University where I went undergraduate. It was on logic programming. And it was like a magic show. That's the best way I can express it. 
every day I'd walk in with my hubris going, I know everything there is to know. And he would present a problem and I would come out of the class where my mind was blown. I'd be like, who would think of this? It's so, it was so far beyond my experience. Um, you know, I, I, I'll give one example. I don't know how many people here are computer people, but uh, he taught the notion of a stack. I go, a stack is the simplest data structure in computer science. There's only two operations. You, you push something onto the stacks, like putting a piece of paper on the top, you know, you push paper number one, paper number two, paper number three, and you can pop. You can't access the middle. You have to pull off paper number one, pull off it. And, he, and I'm going, why is he wasting my time teaching me about a stack, push and pop? I know everything that you could possibly do with a stack. This is a waste of time. And he goes, yes, here's the, how you write a definition of a stack in this language called prologue. And everyone knows if you start with an empty stack and you push paper one, push paper two, push paper three, there's three items in it. And then you pop one, pop two, you pop three and they come off and you end up with an empty stack and the variables are signed. He goes, but with this same definition, you can start with an empty stack and you can run the pop uh, variable. You can run the pop operation first. You can pull off a paper that doesn't exist into a variable X pull off a second paper Y, pull off paper Z, and then put the paper in, and you still end up with an empty stack. I'm like, that, that doesn't make sense. It's like, in time, I wouldn't even know how to begin to write a program. So that's just an example um, of every day, he just opened my mind at a time when I thought I knew it all. And he taught me, I was just scratching the surface. And that whole perspective of logic programming kicked me into high gear of trying to learn the mysteries of science through computers, you know, and, and artificial intelligence. I was most interested in how do we work? How is the miracle that is the human mind with all the subtleties and complexities, how is that possible? And at Brandeis, I have, a, I have a Bachelor of Arts in computer science because I was able to take linguistics and philosophy and psychology and neuroscience and you know, come at that problem, computer science, from many different dimensions. So I would say this kind of interest in how we work. And right at this time where I felt I was plateaued, I met a teacher who just exploded that frame of thinking out of the water. And those two propelled me pretty much through the rest of the career, my career as I continue to seek the mystery of what seems impossible. And yet it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's elegant, it's, it's, it's wondrous. It really sounds like that thread of curiosity and being propelled forward has been a really important thread uh, among across different junctures. And you've had a little bit of an untraditional start to your early career because you did a number of uh, traveling, working abroad, um, and this is all prior to your role at SRI. Could you tell us a little bit more about your thinking process there? Sure. So so I'm magicians don't usually reveal their secrets, but I'm going to reveal my greatest secret, not for magic, but for success. So I call, I, I've, since the time when I just finished undergraduate, it was as if a chapter was closing, right? Life after college is very different than life in college, right? It's just two different things. And I talk about my life almost like a book where you can be a co-author you're not the only author. You don't get to control everything that happens to you. Life or destiny is, is clearly part of it and others in the world, but you're a co-author. You get to influence your story. So if life is a book, there will be chapters in your life. And for me, the goal, like, why are we here? What are we trying to do? For me, the goal is to write the best story possible, to maximize you know, this gift that we are given, which is time here on earth, I don't know what comes after, maybe there's something, maybe nothing, but I know the gift that we have of life on this planet is immensely valuable. It's the most valuable gift we've ever been given. And, and we all have an obligation to make the most of it. So then you're like, well, how do you make the most of the life? What's the metric? What do you decide? 
for me, I say that if at each chapter in your life, you are, you are focused on what's the most important thing you need at that chapter, and if you isolate it and identi identify it and pursue it, over time, you will have a valuable life because you're trying to maximize each minute. So I say, if you're happy, if you're fulfilled, if you're having an incredible time and you're in the middle of Berkeley and it's, it's great, ride it out, Get, make the most of it, enjoy every minute, squeeze the juice. But at some point, every good period will come to an end because people naturally change. You get married, you have different responsibilities, you, whatever, you move. And so I was coming to the chapter change of graduation and there were all these possible paths I could take. One was I got a job offer. It was a well-paying job from my favorite programming language company. Uh, another was there was a famous AI researcher near where I grew up uh, who, who invited me to come work with that person. Uh, and then this other one was uh, a French company had acquired a US company. And I said, how do I decide? Is it the most money? Is it the one my family's telling me about? So what I did was I focused on what I was feeling until it became a core emotion, a core truth in my chest. I turned it into words and I turned it into a mission statement. And then once I had it, I told everyone I met, this is what I'm going to do, even though I had no idea how I was going to do it. And that first one was foreign perspective. And it came from seeing my grandfather who was learning his seventh language in his nineties. And he would walk down the street and speak Polish to this guy and Hungarian to this guy and Yiddish to that guy and German to that guy and Spanish to this guy. And I'm like, he's been so many places. He's seen so many things. He can communicate with so many people. I've never been anywhere. I've never seen the world. I only speak English. And it became important for me to have a piece of my grandfather in my identity, to be worldly, to have, a, to kind of look back on where I was growing. I loved where I grew up, but from a foreign perspective to learn and expand my horizons. So that's what took me. I, I had no idea how to do it, but by telling everyone, I'm gonna get a foreign perspective next, two things happen. One, it commits you to it. And number two, people start to help you. Well, I know this guy who blah, blah, blah. And why don't you try this? And and all of a sudden, I ended up working in France for, uh, for four years. And that was my, and I loved it. I, I, I found an incredible job. It was just what I needed. I traveled, I learned a new language. Um, I was fulfilled in every, every way. And I rode that out until I came to my next important need. And uh, that was the next chapter. Thank you for sharing that story because I know you've defined it uh, as verbally stated goals. And I think that's such a great way for students to remember it by. Um, and outside of students, we also have here a number of alumni and even folks who are decades into their career. So as we dig a little bit deeper into later in your career, would love to hear your thoughts on kind of the major pivot points in your professional career where you decided that that was the right direction to go. Uh, for example, what made you give up France and move over to RSI? Sure. So I loved my time in France. I started out on a small project. It was me uh, as the engineer, a soft um, and a product manager. And we started, uh, and this was in the 80s. So uh, AI at that time was known as expert systems, just like today, AI is deep learning neural nets. Um, that was the thing back then. And we built a neuro, uh, an expert system to help create um, and configure software for 50,000 products. And I got to watch this become a commercial software product and I was at the center of it. But after time I got bored and I dreamed about this golden land uh, called California. Um, and that had been one of my job options and offers. And I had chosen not to pursue that dream and I said, well, um, I wanted to, to learn again. So I felt like I wasn't growing and learning um, and I wanted to see California. So that was my next goal, verbally stated goal, learn again in California. Um, I applied to every um, college on the West Coast, down the coast. 
including Berkeley and Stanford and, and UCLA and many others. But I had a condition. I said, I want to get a master's. And normally a master's program is two, generally three years. I said, I want to do it in nine months. Will you let me try? And UCLA was the one who said, yes, you can try. No one's ever done it in less than 14 months, but have at it. Um, and the reason was I didn't have a lot of time. I thought I would go back to France after my master's now that I had learned again, got a new degree, just kind of rekindled my intellectual curiosity. Um, so I didn't have the time or the money. I was out way out of state and, you know, tuition was expensive back then. It was, I can't tell you, it was $13,000 for the entire year where am I going to get $13,000, right? Today, you guys laugh, but that was a lot of money. In state, in state it was something like, I don't know, a thousand or less than a thousand. So 13,000 was a lot. Um, and my, you know, my salary at the time, my annual salary as a well-paid software engineer was $30,000. So, you know, I had to live. Anyway, um, so I said nine months and uh, I did it and managed to cram in tons of classes. Uh, I wrote a thesis. Um, and then after that, I thought I would go back to France. But again, now I had, I had been in France for four years, but I got bored. And say bored, there's that word again. Um, and so my next goal was where can I spend 10 years and not get bored? I thought I needed a career like my father had where he joined one company out of college and he stayed there his whole career and he worked his way up at the ladder from being this tiny role to being senior vice president of his company. And I thought that's what you needed to do. But I go, I worked at a great company, the best job. And I wasn't learning after four years, where could that be? And the answer to that question led me to SRI. Uh, it used to stand for Stanford Research Institute. It was for a computer scientist, the greatest playground you could imagine. There were robots roaming the halls. They had virtual reality. They had artificial intelligence, speech recognition, it's just starting up. Um, you know, it was like a playground. And so I stayed there uh, two stints, but um, close to 10, over 10 years. But my original goal was where could I stay for 10 years and not get bored? SRI was the answer to that to that question. And it really sounds like not being bored is, has been a key driver and actually should be a driver because life should be full of surprises and be fun and interesting. Um, and obviously then as you spent this longer career at SRI, how did you think about the future direction of where things were going to take you? Because from your time at SRI to then obviously working on Siri, getting acquired by Apple, and then working on Viv Labs, then that became Bixie at Samsung. And there's so many things that have exploded since. Was this something that you had worked on for many years leading up to that? Was it something that you had come up with towards the end of that time there? No, right at the beginning, um, uh, very early on. So literally within the first months I joined SRI, um, I found my first, what I call my career thread, um, which is, it's been this, you know, it's not quite like a PhD. It's just been a curiosity that has spanned 30 years um, now. Uh, so the first one, was in 1993, before I saw a web browser, I said, how can, um, I said, someday there will be content and services around the world we wanna access. You, know, you couldn't do that back then, except for maybe FTP. And I said, we need a way to interact uh, with this and to discover all the services out there. And I never had the idea that we would use hyper documents, hyperlink documents to do that, you know, like the web or search engines, that didn't occur to me. Uh, I thought everyone would have an assistant and you could say, I want to know this or do that. And the assistant would help you get the job done. Um, and I thought you would do that by speaking and clicking on GUIs and using natural language and using handwriting. And you would use any modality. You would have this multimodal interface to access a web of services from computers around the world before I ever saw a web browser. So that was my defining 
goal. I built it in 1993, my first, you could call it my first prototype of Siri. And since then, to this day, I am still pursuing that vision. And I get closer, a Siri was a good step forward. Uh, Viv Labs and, and what we did at Bixby, I can talk about later. It's the closest I've ever come to realizing my vision, but I still fell a little bit short. Um, and so I'm, I still think it's a great idea. The second career thread came maybe two years later at SRI when I met a man named Doug Engelbart, who I think is one of the greatest computer scientists in history. Um, he defined at a time when everyone was interacting with computers using punch cards, he defined everything that is personal computing. So he had the patent for the mouse, the first multi-windowed systems, the first text editors. He invented not only everything that's personal computing, but everything that we know of as the web, he did back in the 60s, hyperlinks, multimedia documents, uh, fine-grained access control, his version of the web had versioning built in. So you could literally just start editing a page and it would record versions anywhere. No wikis and just beautiful, simple. Uh, and everything that we know of collaboration, video conferencing, um, you know, real-time document editing. He had this all in an integrated system in 1968. And if you haven't seen this, I encourage you, uh, type in the mother of all demos and you'll be taken to kind of a dry 90-minute uh, video that is so full of ideas that are beyond even what we have today, uh, it'll blow your mind. There are more startups hidden in his, 19, his December 9th, 1968 presentation that are yet unrealized. So he created this great technology. Why? Because he said, someday the world is going to be faced with complex global problems. And, uh, and, and he listed them things like climate change, like pandemics, like hunger, like poverty, like disease, like sickness, like um, water issues, climate issues. He said, these are global problems that not one person's not gonna be able to just snap their fingers and solve. We have to work collectively together to solve these problems. And he saw, he saw computers as a tool that could augment human intellect augment collective IQ, and he coined this term back in the 60s. Um, and that vision of trying to help humanity think deeper and better about the big problems in the world and the small problems has been another of my career threads. So think change.org and Collaborama and many of the, just like I've built probably 60 different assistants, voice assistants like a Siri, I'm not as many, but I have many collaborative collective IQ type projects as well. And so very early on, I think the vision, those two, you know, kind of interlinked uh, threads of my career formed. And since that, I've just been learning and trying one and trying the other and trying to combine them. And, um, you know, so it's given purpose. If you think about a book, Every good book has chapters, but they also have career threads. They're not just random short stories. It helps to have some meaning, some, some purpose in your inquiry that you're trying to make progress towards. And the closer you get, that gives you satisfaction. And you look back on your career, you look back on your life, and you say, you know, I had an important question, and I've tried and learned and worked towards a goal even though it was in many different chapters, Siri is very different than Viv is very different than, but it's, it has some, some cross chapter purpose and meaning. And, and that's been uh, something very satisfying to me. If we were to, I, I will get into the early story of Siri in a bit, but in the first decade-ish of your career, as you're spending most of your time at SRI, is there anything you would change now in retrospect? Um, especially now that you're looking back with foresight, is there any sort of lessons that you wish you had known back in those early days? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. So I'm the type of person where I'm an optimist about the future and I never second guess decisions I've made in the past. I can't change it. No sense wondering what if, you just move forward from where you are as best as possible. So I, I, 
never ago, I wish I could have, I wish I had done something else. However, there is one lesson that I, I might tell a younger self. Maybe if I were to say there's one thing I would change, um, it's that I've been lucky enough to work at some of the biggest companies in the world, some you know smaller startups. I've worked in not really academia. SRI doesn't have students, but it's really re it's close to academia and research. I've worked in industry. For me, the greatest change agent uh, is the startup, the entre entrepreneurial spirit. And for me, maybe it's not for everyone, but this is something I've discovered relatively late in my life. I was in my 40s before I ever had the idea to start a company. But I now believe that every important thing that exists started really as an idea from an entrepreneur. And often, they started a company and evolved something and made something, you know, to use the magic uh, kind of reference, a magician and an entrepreneur are very similar. They imagine an impossible future and work backwards and solve the math and the science to make it come true. I mean, if you had 20 years ago, I, I started 30 years ago, if you had been able to say, you're gonna have a supercomputer in your pocket that knows who you are and where you are, and you can pull it out and just talk to it, and it will not only understand you, it will talk back to you and help you get things done in the real world. You would have said, you're, uh, that's, that's crazy. That's a magic trick. You're not, you're not talking real, but that's what Siri is, right? So an, an entrepreneur and a, and a magician both imagine an impossible magical future and then figure out how to make it come true. So the one thing, there's no moment where I said I should have done something else but I do wish I had discovered entrepreneurship earlier because I think I, you know, and maybe everything that came before was necessary learning to enable myself to be successful as an entrepreneur once I got around to it. But I do wonder if I, if I had discovered that tool and that important, important framework for change earlier, maybe I might have been able to accomplish even more. As faculty for entrepreneurship, I can't possibly agree more. Um, although entrepreneurship is very difficult to teach. So a lot of it is by experience. And that's why it's so meaningful to have you here to share your experiences with us. And I do want to get into really the core of your entrepreneurial experiences, because obviously everyone looks at the success of Siri, or even in a magic reference, they look at the magic that is presented and they don't necessarily everything, see everything that happens behind the scenes, that is the grind, the challenges, and all that comes with. Can you tell us a little bit more about the early days and how everything became what now everybody has on their phones? Sure. So as I mentioned, my first version of Siri was really envisioned for it was in 1993, very, very early on. Uh, I've done a talk out on the web called Siri Back to the Future. And in this, I say on October 4th, 2011, Siri came out on an iPhone by Apple, the Siri you know and love. And it was wonderful for all these reasons. But let me tell you about this incredible version that we had uh, that we came out with as a little startup in 2010 that was so cool. You know, Steve Wozniak says it's the greatest app that he's ever used, you know, founder of Apple. Uh, and, and that was great for these reasons that never quite made it into the Apple, the in, built in Apple. And that was great, but you should have seen the version that we had in 2007 that we went to investors with. Oh my God, it did things that we never managed to get into that, that shipping app. You know, it was incredible in these ways. And I tell the story of Siri going backwards in time and each step that you go in some dimension becomes more futuristic. There are things that got left on the cutting room floor that never made it to the production version, right? You can't take everything with you when you're trying to get to production, you have to leave some things. So I showed uh, demonstrations from 2011, 2010, 2007, 2003, 1999, 1993. And then the last one, I talked about the Knowledge Navigator video. So in 1987, Apple made a concept video. 
not real, but they were trying to imagine the future. And they created what was like an iPad-like device. And they had an internet web-like thing. And they had a Siri-like assistant you could talk to who, who knew who you were and, and managed your calendar and your contacts and your information and could help you get things done in your day. And the punchline of my talk, I'll, I'll give it away because you probably won't go look at it, was that that 1987 video was set in the future, right? They had to pick a day in the future. And, and you can actually figure out what day the creators chose. And because there's a calendar on a desk with a month and a day, and there's some references to the years, which you can actually figure out. And it turns out that the day they set in that 1987 video spirals you all the way back in time to within two weeks of the Siri launch in 2011. And so it's like this journey through time going further and further back, it gets more and more futuristic. And then you spin back and you realize that there were all these things that could have been done that never made it in. Now everyone wants a better Siri. It's, it's, it's up to you guys. Everyone should now going forward in the future take some of these ideas or new ideas and make, be ambitious, make an assistant completely different than the Siri of today. So that, that's, that's kind of the, um, you know, so Siri has been a long, a long standing thing. In those 20, you know, years or plus 30 years, 28 years, um, timing is important. So a lot of the work was done in research labs. And if we had started the company too early, we would have failed. If we had started the company too late, we would have failed. So in teaching entrepreneurship, I'm not, an, I'm not a teacher, but one of the lessons I would share is how do you know and how do you determine if it's the right time, right? You need to catch a wave. And I have a whole process about that, which I call triggers and trends. So, um, it, it shortly, I, I think kind of uh, at periods in my life, uh, I take time to think where I believe the world is going. I take controversial topics, I do research on it, and then I make opinions. So in 2004, um, it was the 10th anniversary of the web by my counting, and I made 10 predictions for the future for the next 10 years of the web. Oh, 10th anniversary, let me 10 predictions for the next 10 years. Um, and then uh, my, some of them, and then 10 years later, I got up and did another presentation you can find on the web where I scored myself from my original presentation 2004, how did I do? And some were good and some were not good. But I had this belief that certain things would happen because I'd done that research, you know, and, and like, what would the topics be today? Like, is cryptocurrency going to go main, you know, like mainstream or not? controversial you should have an opinion is um you know augmented reality gonna go mainstream you know is apple gonna come out with something that or not you know etc so all of these technologies where you it could go either way have an opinion that's that's the trend your opinions when you see a trigger point that that confirms your belief this gives you the superpower to see into the future so for example, I predicted that there would be an interface revolution. And when the iPhone came out to, to basically to access all the web, the, the world's services and content, when the iPhone came out, I'm like, this is exactly what I've been waiting for. Apps and pinch and zoom. The iPhone is gonna be a success. And many pundits at the time did not agree. They said, oh no, the iPhone's gonna be a fad. Uh, phones are complex. Only phone companies can make something as complicated as a phone. Apple is just a music player company. They make this little iPod thing. It's not a phone. And I'm like, oh no, in two years, Apple has just flipped the game on the telecom industry. Every handset manufacturer, every telco is gonna be desperate to compete with Apple because they've just won. Now I said, what will, because so with that belief, and I had had this trend line and predicted it. When I saw the trigger of the iPhone come out, I knew because I had that belief that the world was gonna go this way anyway. When I saw it, I knew the future. I said, what will the world need two years from now? 
And I said, well, the iPhone has a small screen. The bandwidth back then was super slow. Every click on a web browser was like a minute. It's hard to type. So I said, this Siri idea I've been working on for decades is just the thing because in one round trip, you can say, get me a French restaurant, you know, tomorrow night for two people at eight o'clock and book it. And in one round trip, you don't have to type, you don't need a big screen, it'll just get it done. I go, that's the thing that um, all those telcos who will be desperate to compete with Apple will need to one up Apple. So we started the Siri, which I've been working on forever as a company to take it to market, to build where the market would be two years from now. So that's an example of trends and tri triggers and timing. And so we started a small company, got a few co-founders, raised money, worked two years and came out with a free app in the app store. Really appreciate you sharing that story. And uh, I'm getting some really good questions in the group chat. So I wanna ask you one last question before I take those questions. Um, and the last question is, you know, even prior to us coming over to main stage, we were talking about how during a specific period in your career, you were super productive because you had boxed your time into categories where you would split your time between the different initiatives that you're working on. That obviously ultimately led to now the fact that you have co-founded Siri and uh, what, what became Bixby and also change.org. In this entire process, what would be some of the most challenging times or most difficult challenges you had to overcome um, in your opinion? And how did you overcome those? So I'll pick two quickly. Um, there were technical challenges. So we started this company with a research prototype and it worked really, really well. You could say, find me a French restaurant and it would, and we had these tools and this not new breakthrough natural language approach. and. And then we loaded in 20 million business names. And we realized every word in the English language is a business name. And, and literally what used to be an easy problem now seemed like an insurmountable problem. So people go, well, why is it hard? So if I say book a four-star restaurant in Boston, instantly your brilliant brain knows what I mean. But what if when I tell you that book is a city in the United States, and star is a city in the United States. And there are 13 Bostons in the, in the United States. Which city am I talking about? And star restaurant is the name of a restaurant. And I said four star restaurant, but I'm not talking about a restaurant name. So once you load in huge vocabulary and it's messy and you're having to do fuzzy search across it and it's huge and ambiguities are exponentially creating, it was technically the toughest challenge we had in that project. I remember we used to have a command. You would tell the system start over and it would like restore it to an initial state. I typed in start over and it said looking for businesses named start in over Louisiana. And I'm like, what just happened? Like, oh my God, we're in trouble. And we had to climb out of that, that hole to make um, you know, intent understandable. And it was incredibly challenging technically. We had an amazing team, Chris Brigham and others solved these problems, Didier Guzzoni. Um, so that was the hardest technical challenge. I'd say once we, um, we, we solved the technical challenges, we launched the free app and then this crazy thing happened. We get this phone call at work uh, and it says Apple Cupertino. And we, we, we swipe, we're like, answer, answer, answer. Come on, answer, answer, answer. And we hear this voice, hey, it's Steve. We're like, Steve Jobs? Yeah, yeah, come over to my house tomorrow. What you doing? So Steve Jobs saw our app, one of 2 million apps in the app store, several million, called us, invited us to his house, and he made it clear he wanted to buy our company which was incredible. Um, we said, thank you, we're so flattered. I can't believe this is happening. We're not interested, goodbye. And we left because <laughs> that was not in our plan. Like we're entrepreneurs, we were gonna change the world. Like, but he came back, he and Scott Forstall came back a few months later and convinced us we could change the world more with, with Apple than without. We joined, um, we worked so hard. I'm so proud of what we did at Apple, the, the impact we had. 
at Siri and beyond Siri. Uh, Steve Jobs died uh, the day after Siri launched. And this is something I've only recently been sharing. His admin reached out to me just a few years ago and said Steve Jobs was clinging to life to see the launch of Siri. It was so important. He was desperately hanging on to life until the day Siri launched and he passed the very next day. So my time at Apple was wonderful. It's a long answer to your, your short question was wonderful, but afterwards there were, after Steve passed, there were org changes and new people came into power and they didn't have the vision that Steve and I and you know, had negotiated and understood. And so then the toughest thing I had to face was really the politics of, well, I sold the company, they own it. They get to do, Apple gets to do whatever they want with it. It's their right, they own it. But now the vision was going in a different direction than what I had dreamed of. And what I had talked to Steve about and what he had committed me, you know, committed to me to, to achieve. And that was very hard. And in the end, I, um, how did I address it? How did I deal with it? I, I walked away from huge amount of money. I walked away from a team I loved at a time when Siri was just exploding in popularity. The movie Her was coming out soon. And like everyone was using it. And I walked away because I didn't think the direction was going where I had my early principal vision from 1993. So then I just said, okay, I don't need Apple. I'm gonna start again and started my next company, Viv Labs, to, to try to pursue in the way that was important to me, the vision that I wanted to pursue. And um, yeah, so that I think that that was hard. It's, it's hard to, to have come so far and yet like not been able to get to where I want. But as an entrepreneur, you know, nothing worthwhile comes easy. So pick something you're passionate about. You're probably gonna spend your entire career, your entire life working on it. And if, if you're lucky, you'll have some success and get close to the dream you set out to realize. So, and I think I've been lucky. What a great story that you've shared. And I know I promised to take some questions, but I have to do a quick follow-up, which I recall you had shared previously your favorite memory of Steve Jobs. I won't try to tell the story on your behalf, but I think with the challenge that you've shared, would love to have you share that story with everyone here today and what the experience was like working with him to bring something truly visionary into the world. And obviously what things have been like after you walked away from Apple uh, in terms of building everything. Sure. So uh, so I met Steve for the first time on that day when he invited me and my two co-founders, Doug Kitlaus and Tom Gruber, over to his house. Um, immediately, I noticed the two things that, for me, define Steve Jobs. And I don't read any of the books. I haven't read any of the books about him. I haven't seen any of the movies about him because I have my own memories, my own impression, and I don't want to taint it. I'm sure there's lots of other true things I just want my experiences to stay authentic to me. But the, the two things that define Steve Jobs for me, number one is he was desperate to achieve success. He was desperate. And my reaction was, my gosh, this guy's a billionaire. He's already reinvented so many fields from computing when he came out with the Mac, you know, and graphical interfaces to movies with Pixar, to mobile, to music, to, you know, I'm like, this guy could just chill a little bit. He's, he's incredible. He said he could just like, just relax a little bit. Nothing, no, nothing about that. He did not care what he had achieved before. He was desperate to do great things. And the second part is in um, many times when you meet smart people, and I'm sure like in VC worlds, et cetera, you meet smart people all the time. Many smart people think they know they're the smartest person in the room and they know what they know and they believe what they believe and they're right. Steve was not like that. Because he was desperate to succeed and to win, um, he was always looking to challenge his own assumptions. So that very first day, he asked me a question. He said, Adam, should Apple buy, and he named a company, 
And I said, no, I don't think so. And he's like, what, why, 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 why? We got into a debate or an argument, but there was a lot of passion on both sides. And it was challenging and it was hard, like it was coming right at you. But I defended my position. And the point was, if you had a contrary view, he was going to push on it because he wanted to get it right. If you couldn't defend your position with data and logic and, and rationality, he would knock you aside. Like, don't, don't waste my time. I've got to win. But he was always open to hearing another opinion. And this, for me, is what made him great and to changing his own opinion. And at the end of that conversation, he said, you know what? Maybe I'm going to think about that. And we disagreed in our heard and he would say adam i've heard you I understand what you're saying. We're not going to do it the way you say because A, B, and C, I don't think your concern will be a problem. So we're going to do it this way. And here's, you know, here's why. And I was always okay with that. I go, you're the boss. I always felt he heard me, he thought about it, and he said, here's why we're going a different, different route. So for me, his absolute desire to make the most of every day going forward and to, to make it great and to be open to changing this opinion. That, that for me is defined Steve Jobs. And that is such a perfect story to transition into some of the questions that are getting asked in the group chat, uh, because some of them are asking about this debate that's been going on uh, between a lot of these tech leaders and thought leaders um, for, for years. Uh, so James's question is really around, how do you think about the balance between technology versus is this actually good for humanity? And given that you've founded both Siri and Viv Labs and change.org, I feel like you're the best qualified person to answer this question, which is, there are plenty of scenarios where technology is used for good, but what about in situations where AI is used in automated drones that have killed people in war? How do you balance between the two? Yeah. So in my view, there's nothing like all technology makes huge improvements and productivity and, and that's just the way you know horse horse and, horse and carriages but now you know i have to look at my smog index every day to see you know what the air quality is in los angeles or whatever so unintended consequences who would have imagined that we would get to there i mean uh, take the iphone an incredible tool um, it basically puts at your fingertips access to all the world's information um, with an incredible you know a supercomputer like capability like that should make people smarter and better and able to achieve things um, you never thought before. And yet, you know, people are now addicted to it and they're walking down a sidewalk and bumping into a street lamp because they're glued to their phone or they're, you know, spending more time with a machine than, than the person sitting next to them, right? Is that good, right? And is having an, an answer, a Google answer, uh, helping or hurting inquisitiveness. You, you'll always get an answer to any question you type in. And actually, Yancey Strickler's book, who we talked about in the pre-show uh, pre part, um, refers to this. But then people think, oh, there's an answer. I don't need to be curious about it and pursue it. Whereas if you don't have an answer, now maybe you go think about your own, finding your own answer, right? So, um, Absolutely, every single technology has um, 
productivity enhancements and has negatives. Should we stop trying to develop technology? I don't think so. Um, I think overall, and, and there are books about this, I think you know, the world and human, you know, this is in many ways the best time we've ever lived um, and it'll continue to be so. But, um, you know, can technology be used for bad? Absolutely. And should there be guards against it? Should there be regulations? Uh, I think so in certain cases. I mean, you can see, uh, and again, this book I referred to, Yancey Strickler, he talks about um, how regulations, you know, if you just let industry pursue financial gain, it's not always a best outcome for humanity. You need a more blended value system uh, that you're being scored on as a company. Um, so it's, it's a tough, tough question, um, but I would, I, I'm an optimist. I believe technology is a good thing. I do believe we need to be put guards at the right time. You know, we need some government regulation help, controls, groups um, to make sure things don't stray too far. But um, yeah, tricky question. And on your point on optimism, I'll take two last quick questions from the group chat before we transition into uh, the round table so folks can turn on cameras and ask you questions directly. Uh, so the second last question is Brandon's question around what you would say to people who are afraid of pursuing an idea out of, the, out of fear. Uh, what if they sink a lot of time and energy into it and it still fails? So uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier. I never define what I've done in my career as using the term success and failure, I don't think those have meaning. Um, because, you know, people say, wow, Siri is such a success. I'm like, Siri is my greatest failure in many ways, because it was, you know, I'm so proud of what we accomplished. We moved forward people's conceptions of what human interaction might be. And yet my dream was so much bigger I, I, there were so many things that I wanted Siri to be that it didn't become. It's also my greatest failure in many ways, which, which just, but that wasn't a bad thing. It's like, I tried this, I got, I, I achieved that, but it's not what I wanted. Let me try again. And so I would say everything I've done in my life, in my career has been a failure and everything I've done in my life and career has been a success. And those are just labels that don't mean anything. The only way to fail is if you stop working on it and you give up on it. Um, but you know, even then the journey of getting to a point and maybe realizing it wasn't an important thing to work on and there's something else that's more important to work on, that's not lost time. That's, you know, it's, it's all part of your learning process. So I would say is don't, if you set out trying to achieve success, you're likely going to fail. If you set out trying to pursue something you're passionate about and curious and you're interested in learning about or, or trying to bring about, you can't fail because everything is learning and every partial success piece, you know, will be, should be celebrated in its own right. But, you know, so best I can say. That's such a great way of seeing it. And the last question that we'll ask on the main stage, I'll combine Cervantes and James's question a little bit, which is both about looking into the future. Cervantes was asking specifically about the future of personal companion robots at home. Um, and James was asking a broader question in terms of looking ahead into the future if you see voice assistants evolving even further so that we can get things done without even needing to speak. Oh without even needing to speak. So, um, so I am, so in the field of robotics, which I think was the first one, personal robotics, and in the field of what I'd call brain machine interfaces, which might be one way of evolving, you just think it and now you can communicate through thought. I'm actually surprisingly bullish on both of those. And I'll tell you why. Um, when I remember I went to a conference around 1996 or 97, and it was about user interfaces and everyone was trying to make 
use any technique they could to make a computer seem more human. So there were systems that were using photorealistic displays. There were some using cartoons, some were using speech recognition, every way to make a, a computer seem less like a machine and more human. And all of them, you know, failed mostly for me. And then I saw this, this bucket of wires and bolts in the vague shape of a dog. It was Sony's early IBO, what became Sony IBO, but it wasn't even polished. It had no skin. It was just lights and wires and but it was playing like a little soccer game, kicked it, you know, kind of walked around, kicked a ball in. And then it did this little kind of little dance. I mean, I swear it was just, and I was shocked at the emotion that I felt for a bucket of wires and how much physicality made me care about this computer piece. So with all the other techniques with, um, you know, cartoons and photorealistic this and hyper voice and blah, blah, blah. Somehow it was a bucket of bolts. The physicality touched me in a way that was shocking and surprising to me. So in terms of the future of physical robot companions in a way, I, I'm, you know, surprised myself, but I, I actually think there is something about physical movement that connects to humans. So I, I'm pretty positive on it. On the brain machine interfaces, now uh, somewhat, you know, you talked about technology being used for good and for evil and all of this sort of thing. This one is a scary one for me, but as opposed to many technologies, like will AI become as generally intelligent as humans? I mean, you work with Singularity University. That's one of the topics they talk about a lot. I'm a skeptic, I don't think so. I don't think we're on the right path to achieve human level intelligence in computers. But I do believe brain machine implants will happen in my lifetime, uh, as opposed to AGI, I don't believe that. Um, and the reason is because of cochlear implants. And when I heard and read about cochlear implants, so what are cochlear implants? It's people who have lost their hearing. They do surgery where they open up your skull, put embed a, a, an array of wires and elect, electronics inside your head, hook them up to neurons to stimulate those neurons. And then you have a microphone that gets processed through software to just generate random in the beginning signals to your brain based on the audio coming in. Well, what's crazy about cochlear implants and millions of people have them is your brain will rewire itself and adapt to this new stimulation and now compensate and use it for hearing. So when you, the experience of someone getting a cochlear implant, they put it in, they turn it on, it sounds like static. You wait two weeks and your brain will change to now be able to hear. And then they'll upload a software program that maybe increase, doubles the resolution or the pulse of the signals and you hear static again, and the neuroplasticity adapts. I'm like, oh my gosh, our brains are genius. Like, I, I don't think we're close to figuring out how that works, but because that works, I, uh, we already have with cochlear implants, brain machine implants. And I think, um, you know, I have a friend who's working on a company, his name is Brian Johnson, a company called uh, Kernel. They've been doing experiments in, brain machine interfaces, I think that will happen in my lifetime and um, for good or for bad. So there maybe might be something you want to regulate before Facebook can hear every thought or whatever, but um, I think it will happen. It sounds like overall the future of technology is extremely optimistic, of course, with safeguards in place. Um, with that, thank you so, so much for all of your time with us here today, Adam. Uh, in the interest of time, if it's okay with you, we'll just take a few minutes from you in the private roundtable session so everyone who has signed up can turn on camera and get to meet you briefly face-to-face. -face. Um, but here from the main stage, again, thank you so much for everything you've shared. Uh, what a brilliant session it's been. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Maya, if you don't mind sending the invite,
Thank you very much. We'll see you. Thank you.